We are what we are from, both here and before this that we have become. The essence of our nature and the origin are one. Through essence conceived, paradox begotten, identity formed and origin forgotten, dismembered from memory, remember, remember. I'm not sure how to tell this story, the origins of consciousness. I feel that it may be easier to begin by explaining that there is a pre-material infrastructure from which human consciousness manifests itself in our material world. We've adopted terms in our colloquial lexicon like matrix of consciousness, structure of thought, belief systems, frame of mind, thought forms, thought patterns and many other expressions to describe human consciousness structurally. In observing the structures of the world that humans have built, we will notice precise patterns that reflect the form of consciousness that built them. This infrastructure of human consciousness is in fact universal. It is shared throughout the world despite our varying nationalities, ethnicities, cultures, or our family circumstances. Not only does the infrastructure of consciousness shape our external world, but it also determines our place in it by how our personal identities have been formed within the context of the greater infrastructure itself. As the old saying goes, as within, as without. So what I am attempting to relay is that we form our identities in life from a pre-existing mold, a framework that has existed from the beginning of time and space. Out of this framework or infrastructure, we build our homes, our roads, our cities, our tools, our governments, and our relationships. This infrastructure is also responsible for all human suffering, the suffering we have inflicted on ourselves, each other, and our environment. Everybody knows that something's wrong. The reason why we have not been able to evolve ourselves out of this is that all options for change have been derived from within the infrastructure itself. You can't think your way out of a problem that was created by thought. In other words, the solutions that we have been provided on how to change our lives, how to think better, how to change unwanted behaviors, get out of cycles of abuse, change our societies for the better, end homelessness, hunger, war, sexual violence, and bring the peace we cry out for. All of these solutions, all of these options, have only helped to sustain the very way things are. This is because they originate out of human consciousness, out of an infrastructure that exists only to sustain its existence. I must let you know that I must use this infrastructure to describe the infrastructure, how it formed, how it works, and how to end it. This process of explaining is going to be long and at times complicated. I will do my best to simplify it where I can. However, I want you to know that what I'm attempting to describe is a living, functioning process whose movements, expressions, and manifestations are all interdependent. Yet, if we can understand the simplicity of its origins, then we can understand how everything became so confusing. There is a way to radically and forever change the way we experience life. To live without suffering, in love, in beauty, and in harmony with creation itself. When we understand how this infrastructure works within our own lives and within the human world as a whole, we will then be able to realize the answer we have searched for our whole lives and yet known from the beginning of time. An answer, in a word, more misunderstood than any other. Love. In the following, I will introduce three main characters. They are the primary elements of consciousness. This is where the story begins, with them. I need to explain their qualities before I introduce their relationship. So please understand that as I speak about and describe to you who they are, their essential nature will unfold through their interactions with each other from the beginning of space and time, shaping what we know today as consciousness itself. Also, it is important to remember that the words I use 
are only the best that I have discovered to describe them, and there are, no doubt, many more that can be attributed to them. Shaped from breath and tongue, spoken, shouted, cried, and sung, dressed for the occasion, words are strung in unison. Thread through by intention, they fabricate being and clothe expression in suitable fashion, though they cannot lay bare the nakedness of being that is unconditional love. Translating that which whose very essence sprung forth all perceivable elements, forces, and their various states of dynamism is unfathomable. The problem is not allotted to language alone, with its innate inadequacies, its inability to reflect the essence of experience, without the inevitable conflicts that arise when you are mediated and represented poorly by an incompetent ambassador. Let us acknowledge, once again, that words in closing meaning are only metaphors for being, the being of existence in timeless presence, present as a gift. There is, however, a pre-existing circumstance that hinders our ability to experience, communicate, and translate that which is unconditional with language. Thus, though the limitations of language are innately involved in our conflicts, they are neither causal nor ultimately important here at this time. Unconditional love is the preeminent elemental force, the metaphysical ground for existence and the quintessence of the human spirit. Yet to speak upon it conceives only paradox, for what is infinite becomes finite within the clenching fist of thought. That which is without conditions contains perceivable qualities and yet transcends them. It is as though what we would perceive as tangible fails to behold the majesty of such a bountiful infinitude. With undulations of intangible beingness, showering acceptance in a cosmic dance, unfolding in soft petals of bliss, the notion for capturing its meaning for translation has occurred to all who have rest their cheek upon the pregnant belly of creation and felt the soft kicking of their own potent potential. Qualitatively, its existence is and was present before there was what there now is and still is now that what is came to be. Moreover, within the existential state of being unconditional love, the absolute experiences continuous abundance like a bountiful dance of fulfillment. Because there is no separation spatially or temporally there is no perception of lacking, missing, or needing anything. Desire as we know it today would be as if in a prenatal state, inseparable from both its nourishment and its environment. Therefore, before desire could perceive a need, it exists as undifferentiated potential in a fluid state of unconditional acceptance, negating any primordial need for fulfillment or emergence. Unconditional love may be conceived qualitatively as representing in part a pre-desirous state. For what need could desire plead if before the pleas there was already sure? The two as one, wed as in the word that's read, pleasure. From this state of pre-desire, actions are performed as an extension of being rather than for the purpose of becoming or acquiring. In this way, 
they are not actions at all, but rather extemporaneous expressions of beingness embracing itself. Unconditional love, synonymous with the Absolute, the preeminent source of all that is, is by its very nature unconditionally inclusive. Herein, if only for the sake of convenience, this essential quality intrinsic only to unconditional love shall occasionally be referred to as absolute inclusivity. Furthermore, it is important to note the pre-temporal and pre-spatial nature of the absolute, because the essence of its beingness is not centralized or localized in relation to any perceived separation of itself with that which it is not. Any perceived object within itself and the subsequent space between such an object and another is indivisible, non-existent. Therefore, mobility is omnidirectional, while simultaneously being omnipresent. Thus, through omnipresence, it is omniscient, and through omniscience, it is omnipotent. That which whose very essence is unconditionally inclusive contains no opposite, as some have called it, one without a second. That is to say that being inclusive of all realities as representations of itself, unconditional love containing the essential quality of absolute inclusivity does not differentiate itself into duality, bifurcate its beingness, or distinguish itself through dichotomy. The vastness of its all-inclusive acceptance includes even that which opposes it, denies it, rejects it, or is ignorant of it. This is the origin of creation itself. types of spatial experience we all share. The first is the physical space of our earthly existence, and within it we have physical time. Physical space and time play only a small part in the existence of life, like a pen and ink play only a small part in the words you write. There is, however, a second type of space and time we all share. This second type of space-time is more dynamic and far-reaching than that of physical space and time. For it precedes them, it lives, and it functions within them. This second type of space-time is actually the pre-material infrastructure of our personal and collective identities. I wanted to take a moment and introduce a new word that describes the second and more fundamental space-time experience. Psychospatial temporality. It refers to our inner experience within ourselves and how we move through our minds in our own psychological space and psychological time. As I'll be going into this much deeper in the future, let me say for now that psychospatial temporality, or psychological space-time, shares similar features to that of physical space and time because it was created at the beginning of space and time as we know it. Lastly, psychospatial temporality refers to the fully matured and fully functional infrastructure of consciousness. So before I can go into this further and describe it in its maturity, let's continue with the introduction of our second character in the story, the antithetical force. Now to put it simply, the antithetical force is the psychological space between both us and our memories, our thoughts, and between us and our perception of other people, places, and things in the external world. In other words, the antithetical force is psychospatiality itself. It is the emptiness inside us, the cause of the feeling of being disconnected, not heard, and not seen for who you feel you truly are. It is the cause of all suffering, conflict, and conditioning of personal and collective identity. Metaphysically speaking, the antithetical force is an essential elemental force that is pre-material in location and possesses the primary quality of absolute exclusivity. 
That is to say, that its primary essence is located on a frequency of consciousness higher than that of matter, behind material formation acting through matter, reforming matter into manifestation as the material world we have created. Our homes, towns, cities, and countries are collectively its material body. Our laws, systems of government, and education, our social stratifications, forms of entertainment, our belief systems, religions, and science itself, all that is its mind in operation within its body, and we are its source of sustenance. The most basic notion of subject-object duality, the notion that I am separate from you and you from me, that we are separate from our environment, this most basic concept, intrinsic to all functions of human existence, is the cornerstone of the infrastructure of consciousness. Unlike unconditional love with its primary quality of absolute inclusivity, which itself has no opposite, the antithetical force with its essential elemental quality of absolute exclusivity is the cause of all opposition. Its very nature is the force of resistance one feels when confronting their own thoughts and subsequent feelings. It is the resistance to presence, the same resistance that allows us individuality and the endless choices for false fulfillment in people, places, and things outside of ourselves. Choices that never bring true fulfillment, joy, or anything more than temporary distractions from the present moment a present moment filled with thoughts, feelings, relationships, and experiences imbued with conflict that owe their very cause to the same thing that provides them with more options, more choices, the antithetical force, psychospatiality, the same thing that divides us subsequently unites us divisively. The antithetical force created the very notion of oneself as different from that which is not oneself. And thus, this notion, this belief of difference, is experienced within us as the psychological space between us and our thoughts, between us and our perception of the world. Therefore, psychospatiality is at its root absolute exclusivity. The space must be empty and exclude all things in order to exist, and consequently, the same space must be empty for us as isolated individuals to exist. The antithetical force, as psychospatiality, in other words, is unable to exist as anything other than itself. It operates, functions, and enacts its primary agenda, which, inseparable from its very essence, is to fragment the unified continuum of what has been called God, Spirit, unconditional love, the Absolute, etc., into an infinite mosaic of shattered shards defiling creation in its mocking reformation. The perversion of reality occurs through qualitative distinctions of identity that divide the once unified spiritual essence in opposition to itself, through the fragmentation of undifferentiated beingness into being someone, something, somewhere, somehow. In order for it to exist, it must enact its essential nature, its modus operandi, through the frequency of human consciousness via the human spirit and create an environment internally and externally where form reflects the function of the antithetical forces existential purpose therefore it is responsible for the form and function of energetic dynamics in all human relations including organized social structures institutions our utilities and tools the human habitats we build by them and the belief systems that operate within them. To be clear, it dominates the world at the level of human self-consciousness, from which through us it creates an environment out of its own image, for no other reason than to implement its primary agenda and existential purpose. However, in order that it succeeds and continues to thrive in the place of human spirit at the throne of consciousness, we must remain its source of sustenance and livelihood through the sacrificial offerings of emotional, physical, and psychological suffering we endure and inflict upon others, both in its multitude of names and under its pseudo-godlike rule. 
So again, to be clear, the antithetical force establishes conditionality first at the level of human consciousness acting within form. It replaces our unconditional nature with conditionality, altering our original spiritual vibrational frequency, therefore altering the dimensions of our manifest possibility from the absolute inclusivity of unconditional love into what we know as self or personal identity. Once establishing itself upon the throne of human consciousness, it sets about creating a distinct identity within the human form it occupies. Simultaneously, while creating self-ideation, self-concept, and identity as an individual, the antithetical force is shaping the individual to serve as a functioning unit within the medium of its own essence, within the world it shaped, the world we know collectively as humanity. Just as there are two types of space, physical space and psychological space, there are two types of time. Just as spin and rotation are qualities of physical time, spin and rotation play a part in psychological time, or as I may refer to it, psychotemporality. The antithetical force, synonymous with psychospatiality, or psychological space, is responsible for the empty boundaries that appear between us and our thoughts in the perception of a self in isolation to other selves in the external material world. The antithetical force functions interdependently with psychotemporality, psychological time, and it is not any more autonomous than physical space is from physical time. The movement through the infrastructure of consciousness, through our own inner world of thoughts, feelings, and memories, the movement is governed by both psychospatiality and psychotemporality. The boundaries defining difference within our minds and the time those boundaries were erected combine to create psychological space-time. The physical time when we experience something that forever shaped our notion of the world, who we are, and our place in it. The shape that shapes our notion of ourselves and the world is the space that divides us from it externally and internally. This shape is psychospatiality. The notion of ourselves is shaped and defined within that space, within that space, separated from other notions of ourself and the world in psychological time. Across the divide of psychological space, we see or sense an image in our minds of a thought, of a memory, of an event. Across that divide, psychological space defines a moment in psychological time. All that seems so full in thought, its essence, before it was defined in our minds, given a name, an identity, and trapped as such in psychological time. What this is came from the source of all that is, to become the source of nourishment and sustenance for the antithetical force. What this is that's trapped in time inside our memories is what we have come to call desire. Next to love, the second most misunderstood experience is desire. The book World Scripture, a comparative anthology of sacred texts by the International Religious Foundation, copyright 1991 and published by Paragon House Publishers states, Every major religion recognizes that suffering and evil are caused by excessive desires and desires directed towards a selfish purpose. And yet I contend that every major religion is wrong. Desire has received the lion's share of blame and responsibility for the suffering of humanity from farther back in time than most can remember. It is not desire, but that which directs desire. It is not desire, but that which defines it, and its options, its choices, its avenues for fulfillment. That which conditions the essence of desire to seek that which only denies it what it really wants, what it really needs. It is that which in so defining it, cuts it off from its origin, and trains it to want things that only help redefine the boundaries of its own identity, giving life 
to the limitations, to the boundaries, and the space between all things and itself. Thus, then wanting what is outside of itself. The essence and the origin of all desire is unconditional love. In fact, desire is unconditional love trapped within the spatial confines of identity, within psycho-temporality, surrounded by the emptiness of psychospatiality, trapped in time, isolated and surrounded by the empty spaces within our minds. The essence of all thought is desire. The impetus for all actions is desire. All the suffering that has been attributed to desire has made desire appear as the attributes that define desire. The attributes that lay blame upon desire and demand its limitation are sustained by the expression of desire's perversion as it acts out within the confines of the limitations set forth by the attributes themselves. In other words, it has never been desire that has caused us all this suffering. It has been that which programmed desire to seek fulfillment in that which will only justify the need to limit desire and justify the judgments upon it by having desire programmed to run through a maze like a rat after cheese. A maze in our minds whose path has been defined by the walls of identity and the spaces in between. This is the function of the antithetical force. To entrap unconditional love within the isolation of identity, thus transforming unconditional love into desire and directing desire towards choices for fulfillment that justify, sustain, and support the infrastructure of consciousness, the body of the antithetical force.